today, uh, Donald Tusk, not uh, Trump, uh, who's the president of the European Council, said that there is a, quote, special place in hell for Brexiteers. Um, I, can, uh, I can say that, uh, that tonight's guest um, will not have uh, that special place uh, reserved for him um, in hell. But he and, uh, and, and Donald Tusk um, both are, are worried about um, or thinking about the kinds of um, entanglements that happen when um, countries form alliances with one another, political, economic. Um, Professor Pesey's thinking about it more in terms of the early modern period, about which he'll uh, talk to us, um, but I think he thinks there are applicabilities to, uh, to our present. Um, and one of the things, one of the things that uh, made me want to invite uh, Jason was that he's somebody who thinks that history's a way to think about um, not just how we were, but how we are and what we might um, be. So who is um, Professor Pesey? He's a professor of early modern British history at University College London. He did his PhD at Cambridge University. Uh, before coming to UCL, he was a research fellow in the History of Parliament Trust. His books uh, include uh, Politicians and Pamphleteers, Propaganda in the English Civil War and Interregnum, and most recently, uh, Print and Public Politics in the English Revolution. Uh, in addition to um, three edited books, and I counted six dozen um, articles or book chapters. Um, he's currently finishing a book called The Church Robber and the Madman, um, after which he'll get down properly to work on an on a, like 80th book on the business um, that he is talking about tonight. So he comes to us tonight as a guest of the George Washington Forum on American Ideas, Politics, and Institutions. Um, as ever, it doesn't uh, take your money, uh, doesn't receive federal funding, doesn't receive university funding, but relies on private donations. And I'm happy to say that tonight's talk uh, is underwritten by generous donations from Ohio University alumni and staff, uh, and by a grant from the Charles Koch Foundation, and by a grant from the Thomas W. Smith Foundation through the Jack Miller Center. I want to thank them for helping us bring Jason PC uh, to OU tonight, and I hope you'll join with me, me in welcoming him here. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everybody. Um, for coming. I've been outed. I've just been outed as a, as a Remainer, or in the English uh, political parlance, a Remona, because all we do is we, we moan about the fact that we are not going to be remaining um, as part of the EU. Um, if I hadn't already been outed, I think it probably uh, will become <laughs> clear. I mean, this isn't a talk about Brexit. Um, Brexit comes up. Some of the things, as Robert said, may shed some light on how I've been thinking as a historian um, in the times that I, we um, are living through. My talk is about politi political economy, the topic, the subject, the sub-discipline of political economy. But it's also about different ways of studying history and how different approaches can reveal different things. Not necessarily things that are entirely incompatible, but certainly things that suggest that the past was complicated. More complicated, I want to suggest, than some historians um, would lead us to believe. I won't necessarily name names, you'll have to guess who I'm talking about. Um, and that our job is to do justice to that complexity while also being able to not just succumb to complexity, um, but also de to detect patterns in terms of ideas, behavior, and the forces that um, affected continuity and change in whatever period we're studying. These are big issues of which all historians need to be or should be aware. And on this occasion, they can usefully be explored, I want to suggest, by examining how the topic of political economy is thought about and studied by historians of the early modern period, um, the period that I work on, as Robert said. My aim will be to identify some of the limitations of existing scholarship, how it has been done, and to suggest ways in which it might be possible to develop, to develop alternative perspectives on political economy by looking at a topic like political economy from what I think is a slightly different direction. First, of course, it is necessary to briefly introduce my topic by outlining what I mean by, or what is meant by, political economy. In essence, um, it does what it says on the tin, in essence, as the term suggests, political economy is the study by governments, by policymakers, 
and indeed by historians who are studying the past. The study of the ways in which politics and the economy, trade, wealth generation, wealth distribution, were related or thought to be related um, and how economic issues impinged upon and intersected with um, things like the law, customs, morality, and most obviously, government. So when a modern politician, um, who will be readily identifiable, I think, um, when a modern politician reflects on the likely success or failure at, um, in, the, uh, in an election by saying something like, it's the economy, stupid, they are, they are saying that econo economics matters for politicians. When politicians become embroiled in debates about who should pay tax and how much and about which course of action would be the best one for society or whatever, they are recognizing that politics impinges upon economics. This is political economy and it can involve bringing economic issues and data to bear on political decisions or political and indeed religious and moral issues to bear on economics. In terms of policy formation, resource allocation and so on. And it can obviously be thought about in domestic or international or indeed in global ways. Although often these are hard to separate in practice. Protectionism is a version of political economy because it involves economic and political considerations coming together, not least with a view to bolstering domestic trades or industries or communities. Whether or not to engage in a trade war with China is also a version or involves a version predicated upon a version of political economy. So too, in the context of my own uh, country, is Brexit. Brexit is about political economy. The decision about whether or not to leave the European Union involved, essentially involved questions about the most profitable economic path to take, but also other issues, immigration, sovereignty, taking back control, and actually, in some senses, for some voters, essentially, morality, issues of morality underpinned their decision making. And of course, these are, in many ways, political decisions as well as economic decisions. So we can, recognize this, we can recognize that these issues involve political economy irrespective of the positions we as individuals take on them. Whatever we think about a trade war with China, whatever we think about Brexit, we can recognize that what we're doing in thinking about those things is thinking about political economy. Just as we can recognize that uh, a, a kind of French economist or sociologist or whatever we want to call him, like Thomas Piketty, is seeking to rethink modern notions of, modern approaches to political economy by suggesting that there are reasons to reconsider the nature and impact of economic inequality. Economic inequality becomes a political issue. That, therefore, is political economy. Now, as historians of political economy, our job is to try and recover how people in the past thought about the relationship between politics and the economy, and what kinds of policies they advocated and pursued, conscious of the fact, we should be conscious of the fact, that their views about what mattered in political terms and about how economies worked have changed over time. We have ways of thinking about the relationship between politics and economics. They did not necessarily think in those ways. Our job is to recover those ways of thinking. The term political economy, we sometimes associate with the 18th century, with the rise of what is now thought of as classical economics. Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Thomas Malthus, a host of uh, European writers, Rousseau, for example. The term itself, political economy, only be began to be used in England in the 1770s or 1780s. Um, but it seems to me has a validity for whatever period we're talking about. The version that Adam Smith um, propounded, that version of classical political economy, is not, it seems to me, an uncomplicated thing to pin down, too easy to equate um, with modern laissez-faire economics. Even with classical economics, in other words, we have to think carefully about what they were and weren't saying. 
But we can also recognize that for earlier periods, we're going to be doing more of a, re a recovery job, getting into their ways of thinking, their modes of thinking. Adam Smith was reacting to developing ideas that emerged in the 17th century. In that sense, political economy is rooted in the period that I study, the 17th century. We can, in other words, and should, we need to um, understand the political economy of earlier times because all periods, as I said, all periods and places demonstrate some kind of idea about political economy. Some kind of, they reveal some kind of debate about how to link the two, politics and economics, even if this did not necessarily involve uh, a, a discipline conceived of, let alone a science of economics conceived of as we might. They didn't have the topic of economics. They didn't have it as a discipline, a science, and yet um, they were thinking um, uh, as proto-political economists in a way because they understood that they need to link these two things. Before the, late se the, before the late 18th century, people in Britain might not have used the term political economy, but they were doing it. They would have used the term like common weal, the welfare of the commonwealth, the good of the commonwealth, the well-being of the commonwealth. And my interest in that sense is to recover what the 17th century might give us in terms of a, an alternative way of thinking about political economy, how they developed ideas that would then be challenged and changed into what we now think of as modern political economy in the world of Adam Smith and beyond. And what I, want, what I think this will enable me to do, hopefully, um, is to demonstrate that historians cannot always agree on how political economy was conceived of in the past, and that there might be very different ways of approaching the topic, only some of which, I want to suggest, have been adequately developed so far. For a historian like me of, the early, of early modern Britain, it seems fair to say that contemporaries thought about the issues that we associate with political economy without necessarily conceptualizing or theorizing this thought process in the ways that we might do. As such, there, is, there are a variety of ways of exploring political economy, early modern style. We might look, for example, at something like the Statute of Artificers of 1563, a slightly random example, an act of parliament that sought to control prices, impose maximum wages, restrict um, the freedom of, of workers, if you want to call them that, employees, um, in, in, to restrict their freedom of movement and to regulate the training that they needed to have um, um, in order to practice uh, whatever trade they practiced. We might look at the changing ways in which unemployment was dealt with, thought about, and debated. Were the poor and destitute deserving or undeserving of help? Not entirely uh, an early modern thought process. How could the poor best be helped? Perhaps those who travel around the country looking for work ought to be whipped back to their place of origin as vagrants so that their own communities could carry any burden that was thought appropriate in terms of offering them charity. Perhaps they, could be made, sorry, perhaps they could be made to wear badges as a sign of identity and stigma. Perhaps instead, they ought to be treated not as an undesirable burden on society, but instead as an underutilized and unproductive resource. And perhaps means, therefore, needed to be found for providing them with work, perhaps in something like a workhouse forced labor, uh, in if you like, in return for help. Now, all of these things um, were tried and thought about, and we might even, as historians, detect a movement from the former kind of treatment, the stigma, to um, the latter, the kind of support, tough love, if you like. And certainly, we can uh, sense and detect a debate about how to deal with the issue and about what kind of poor law or poor relief to introduce. Interestingly, historians who've studied these things detect um, whether change, or seek to detect, whether change came from, from above, from the center, from government, from national governments, from a centralized state, or whether instead initiatives in which the state took a, a more active role, 
and thus grew in size and importance as a state, actually came from below, from the localities, from the regions, from local initiatives. In other words, thinking about political economy on whatever issue, the, how to treat the poor is just one example, thinking about political economy opens up a series of issues. It's a way into understanding how the early modern world worked. What was the power of the state? Um, was the state powerful or not powerful, effective or ineffective? Where did initiatives come from? And historians like uh, Paul Slack um, uh, have tried to detect all sorts of different ways in which contemporaries in the early modern period were concerned with improvement. Improvement was a key buzzword. We need to find ways of improving the world, improving the well-being uh, uh, and the lives of uh, the people uh, in, in our country people's material lives. What he has discerned, in other words, is an attempt to think about how best improvement could be brought about, and indeed whether or not there was a politics to this. If we're to make people better, and better off, and better provided for, how do we do that? What kind of politics, or indeed morality, what kind of policy um, will we need um, in order to proceed? <coughs> Excuse me. We could also think about how specific trades were managed. This too is a version of political economy in the early modern world. And a, and a key way, another way of thinking about how they thought differently, perhaps, to us. What, in other words, was life like if you were um, a carpenter or a goldsmith? Essentially, this required becoming a member of a professional guild, uh, 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 run by the elite of that chosen profession, who tightly controlled um, who was allowed to practice being a carpenter or a goldsmith, i.e. who was made free of a particular guild or company after having completed a seven-year apprenticeship. Completing an apprenticeship was the key to becoming a citizen. Completing your training gave you citizenship rights with certain specified rights and responsibilities. An incredibly clear way of connecting the politics and the economics, or the economics and the politics. Since the number of apprentices could be tightly regulated, only X number can be uh, admitted at any one year to become a goldsmith, this resulted in individual trades being more or less strictly controlled, which eventually led to serious political debates about the rights and wrongs, harms and benefits of such a system just as there was a debate about whether monopolies, including state-backed manufacturing, trading, and regulatory um, monopolies, were helpful or harmful. At every turn, as soon as they thought about even minute aspects of economic life, there were political issues. And the way that they thought about those political issues is somewhat discomforting for us, or discombobulating. They thought about these things in ways that we tend not to. <coughs> we might also think about the early origins of, or the nascent science of, something like our version or our approach to political economy, in terms of the rise of what historians call political arithmetic in the second half of the 17th century. This involved, really for the first time, for uh, a kind of economists and politicians, thinking about how we might usefully measure things, national income, population, by age, sex, um, or occupation. How to measure these things accurately and then use such information as part of political processes. Reasoning, if you like, by numbers. Upon things related, reasoning upon things relating to government. Pioneered by men like John Graunt, Gregory King, uh, William Petty. These people by the late 17th century, we are getting to something that looks and feels a bit more like economics, designed as something to help with the political process. And it went a hand in hand, interestingly, with um, a, a greater willingness by politicians and, uh, and parliaments to intervene in economic affairs, providing the tools for a political elite to pursue policies relating to the economy, to think about taxation, how much money to raise, to think about how best to ensure that people lent money to governments, for example. How much did we have to protect property rights if we're going to encourage people to lend to our government 
so that a government can pursue whatever policies it wants to. These are all illustrations, if you like, of how we can approach, in the context of domestic affairs, domestic life, we can think about how they went about thinking about political economy. These are just examples of the kinds of thought processes they went through that are somewhat different from ours, but that we can um, recover. Perhaps a more important approach to thinking about political economy in the early modern period, important perhaps because it's more contested and debated, and perhaps ultimately also problematic, involves the international di dimensions of political economy in the early modern period. This has received much more attention in interesting and, as I say, problematic ways. And what I mean by this is thinking about how contemporaries thought about the relationship between issues of wealth, money, and economics on the one hand, and international affairs on the other. Whereas we might nowadays think about this in relation to the politics of globalization, and global finance, or indeed reactions against um, globalization, the issue that historians have identified for the early modern period involve what is sometimes called mercantilism. Now this is a hugely important term, a hugely important concept, but it is also contested. In a sense, for a long time, what happened was historians thought or argued that mercantilism as an idea was the dominant paradigm, the dominant way, the dominant idea uh, kind of re that related politics to economics um, in the early modern period for much of the 16th and 17th centuries. And something that affected how contemporaries thought about the relationship between their own country and the wider world. It was, in other words, an example of how economic thinking had an impact, or was thought to have an impact, on international politics. So what does mercantilism mean? In essence, this was the view, we are told, that the sources of wealth, this is an example of how they thought differently, um, this was the view that the sources, sources of wealth were limited, indeed finite, and that in a situation of scarcity, there were limits to the amount of growth, economic growth, that it was possible to achieve. Another way of uh, describing this is a theory, if you like, that um, it was necessary to control as much money, cash, or in the early modern terms, gold bullion, as possible. The more cash or gold you held, the better you were, because things are finite. It was a theory that obviously had ramifications in terms of how nations or states, or however you want to call them, interacted with each other. If wealth was limited, then trade involved what is called a zero-sum game. One country can only get richer if another one gets poorer. That's the basis of the idea of mercantilism. This created the temptation or the incentive for individual states to grab as much as possible of a, of a fixed-sized pie, if you like, or uh, all, this, all the gold you can get your hands on. Because that pie cannot get any bigger. That's the way they thought. In essence, therefore, um, mercantilism, so-called, underpinned the idea of international relations as competitive. We can win by others losing. We can't all win. If we're not going to lose, we have to win. Mercantilist governments, therefore, it was said, tended to introduce a certain range or type of policies guided by their theories about the economy. The economy, their ideas about how the economy worked, determined, in a sense, their views about how to engage with other nations. To the extent that this involved international trade, it involved trying to maximize exports, and regulating the domestic economy to augment, augment, if you like, state power at the expense of rival powers in order to achieve the best possible balance of trade. It was, in other words, an export-maximizing, cash-acquiring theory. Uh, perfectly encapsulated, uh, this is, you'll see that word again, uh, perfectly encapsulated uh, by the author of, of a 1549 book called The Discourse of the Common Wheel, common wheel, um, who said, we must always take heed that we buy no more from strangers than we sell them. For so uh, should we impoverish ourselves 
and enrich them. We can't all get richer. Such ideas were made emphatically clear by subsequent authors in the 17th century, Gerard de Molines, Thomas Munn, and the author of a pamphlet that kind of, in a sense, conjures up all of this, these notions in its very title. England's treasure by foreign trade, or the balance of our foreign trade, is the rule of our treasure. Such writers, proto-political economists, if you like, advocated a string of policies that were thought to be logical. The politics is driven, the logical political decisions are driven by your view of the economy. And importantly for our purposes, um, there was, as I say, a politics to this, not least internationally. Quite logically for them, therefore, so the history, standard history goes, this was a theory about international competition and overseas expansion and of military armament. In order to protect merchants and perhaps even to attack rival states, and acquire new territories. It was associated with policies that we now um, describe as the Navigation Acts, introduced repeatedly from 1651 onwards in England, um, 1660, 1663, 1673, and so on, um, but with earlier antecedents. Here the idea was to ensure that as far as possible, goods, English goods, should be carried by English ships or at least not by intermediaries and middlemen, the so-called carrying trade. The issue of middlemen merchants was intimately linked to the Dutch and English relations to the Dutch, the subject on which I will kind of increasingly dwell as this talk goes on. So whereas in the 16th and early 17th century, the competitive threat was perceived to be the Spanish, what we've got to do is to prevent the Spanish as Englishmen or women, we've got to con prevent the Spanish from controlling too much land and especially gold reserves. That was the thought process in the 16th, uh, 16th century, the mercantilist view. The Spanish are our competitors. Let's, um, uh, in a sense, defeat them. Eventually, by the 17th century, the main source of competition was thought to be the Dutch, not least because they dominated trade and, and how goods were carried around the world. The main competitor, in other words, so the standard history goes, was the Dutch Republic. Their merchants, Dutch merchants, came to dominate fishing and the trade in high quality textiles. They mastered long distance exploration by means of joint stock companies like the Dutch East India Company, and they made huge inroads, not least at the expense it was thought or said uh, of the English, in the so-called spice islands of modern Indonesia. The Anglo-Dutch relationship crucial to a certain kind of idea about mercantilism, I, crucial to what we thought or used to think was how they thought about um, political economy. This Anglo-Dutch relationship has been particularly interesting and important for historians who are interested in international political economy in the 17th century. Not least because it has provided one of the most kind of crucial areas of debate of recent decades. So for a long time, it was argued that prevalent mercantilism underpinned, perhaps made inevitable, war between England and the United Provinces, or the Dutch Republic. There were three, indeed, three such wars between um, England and Holland, or the Dutch Republic, that were said to be based upon economic competition, arising from mercantilist views. That was the standard, if you like, old-fashioned history. We went to war because they were economically uh, competitive with us. The first Anglo-Dutch War, 1652-4 to four, therefore, um, it was noted, um, came in the wake of the first formal Navigation Act of 1651. And historians detected the involvement in the war of leading merchant politicians who were angry at Dutch economic success, which it was thought necessarily came at their English expense. It was a story of English uh, uh, English sea power, growing English sea power. The war, of course, uh, revolved around sea battles. It was a story of competition for overseas territory, including, of course, uh, New York, grabbed, uh, uh, formerly, of course, New Amsterdam, grabbed um, from the Dutch by the English in 1664. The Dutch, Anglo-Dutch wars of the 1660s, it, in other words, were also said, like the wars of the 1650s, uh, to, in a sense, reflect and come in the wake of aggressively mercantilist policies. 
and then the war of the 1670s represented the, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of um, aftershocks of those earlier wars, not least um, the English attempt to overcome the humiliation of a Dutch fleet sailing up the Medway and, and attacking um, the naval ports. So mercantilism, in, in other words, was the economic theory that was said to explain political decisions which involved commercial rivalry, overseas expansion, and colonization. Ultimately, it was said to provide one of the clearest, clearest ways, alongside the religious and con confessional issues that underpinned um, the Thirty Years' War um, of the earlier 17th century, one of the key ways of explaining European warfare in the 17th century, as well as the early history of imperial expansion, not to mention the domestic political controversies that naturally arose, the controversies that threatened Charles I, threatened the Commonwealth, threatened Charles II, and threatened James II. Indeed, a traditional argument involved the idea that the 17th century witnessed a gradual shift from confessional religious wars to a European system based upon economically driven policies and the balance of power between sovereign states and states that competed with each other economically. This involved the rise of the so-called Westphalian system, named after the Peace of Westphalia of 1648, which was said to have ushered in a system based upon um, uh, 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 competing sovereign states, independent sovereign states, the competition between those states being driven more or less or increasingly by economic competition. Aggression between such states, it was said, was held in check by a so-called balance of power between nations which did not interfere in each other's domestic affairs, but competed internationally. Each prince or state, in other words, had exclusive sovereignty over lands, laws, people, and religion. Westphalia is often seen, therefore, as bringing an end to attempts to, impro to, uh, to, attempts to impose supranational authority, universal monarchy, papal authority, and it is said to have held sway, this Westphalian system, until 1945, in some way, shape, or form, even if not underpinned directly by mercantilist ideas. The reason for setting out um, this old-fashioned, as I'm calling it, theory of mercantilism, and of its connection to international politics, is that it has been, is being, subjected to an important wave of revisionist, if you like, revisionist rethinking by a host of different scholars. In certain ways, his certain historians have never accepted that mercantilism was the dominant ideology or dominant theory. Um, my own colleague at, at, at UCL, Julian Hoppet, is adamant that mercantilism never really existed in the sense that it never held sway, there was never a coherent government policy, governments were too weak to have coherent economic policies, um, everything was much more improvised, localized, um, to the extent that they had mercantilist policies, they were unenforceable, uh, and so on. The governments were too weak. But this rethinking of mercantilism, whether mercantilism was so prevalent, whether that version of political economy uh, 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 prevailed, has also been challenged and rethought in relation to international affairs. And here, the most important historian, and indeed a historian who has graced this very room um, uh, in one of these lectures, um, Steve Pincus, um, formerly of Chicago, Yale, and now Chicago again. Pincus's ideas in particular are worth considering in terms of the degree to which they are challenging, but also in terms of the degree to which um, perhaps he hasn't challenged enough the ways in which we can think about political economy, what it was and what it might be and how it might be studied. So Pincus is a, a marvelous historian. Um, I'm full of admiration for him. Um, not least because he helped revive the study of the Anglo-Dutch wars of the 17th century. That's where he began. And at that point, he, in a sense, what he was doing was stressing that Anglo-Dutch wars were not entirely um, economic in origin. So no, these were not mercantilist wars because they weren't necessarily about um, the economy. They were ideological wars, he said. Wars which helped to help us to see a shift from religious wars to secular wars in the 17th century. More recently, Pincus has argued that there really wasn't 
a mercantilist consensus at all in the 17th century, or at least after the mid-17th century. Instead, there were competing ideas about wealth and the economy, which resulted in political debate and division. I, there's a massive fault line about in, in terms of how that emerges in terms of how uh, political economy is done or uh, conceptualized in the 17th century. So he traces the emergence of new kinds of republican ideas about commercial society, which privileged wealth over virtue, and which ultimately argued that wealth came from labor and not from the land, laboring, the process of laboring, the process of human endeavor. And that wealth ultimately was potentially infinite, not finite. In that sense, if wealth is not finite, then international relations and trade is not a zero-sum game in which winners required losers. He detected, in other words, from the mid-17th century, a kind of radical group of writers, Slingsby Bethel, Henry Robinson, Benjamin Worsley, and so on, and, and then a host of other writers in the late um, 17th century, policymakers, that he effectively groups together as Whigs, political Whigs, who believed in manufacturing, trade, and the infinite possibilities for wealth creation, who were opposed to Tories, um, political Tories, who believed in a land-based economy, and who believed that wealth was indeed finite, that trade was indeed a zero-sum game, and who favored mon monopolistic um, bodies and corporations like the East India Company. For Pincus, this resulted in a political debate, a stark political debate, and it underpinned for him the Glorious Revolution of 1688-9, um, which sought to remove a Tory, in a sense, James II, because he opposed the Whig views of the economy. Pincus sees the Glorious Revolution as the cause of the, of the subsequent financial revolution, as the Whig view of the economy generated demand for a national bank, the Bank of England, um, to promote national prosperity. It is sometimes said, I won't be the first to say, that Pincus's distinction between Whigs and Tories is somewhat oversimplified, overblown, if you like. But what is also interesting is that to the extent that Pincus is tracing politics, political debates, and policy changes to economic ideas, they're grounded in uh, economic ideas for him, he is not necessarily, it seems to me, shifting the goalposts in other ways. Pincus's Whigs certainly um, believed in the role of the state to bolster the economy and ensure national strength, even, in diff even if only in different ways from the Tories. And although Pincus suggests that the Tory view of the economy was inherently belligerent, given the zero-sum nature of trade, it is less clear to me that the Whig foreign policy that he detects um, really shifted in fundamental ways. He insists that attitudes had changed in certain respects. It was possible, in other words, to see trading nations as, being not, as not being in competition with England. And the implications of ideas about wealth being infinite were perhaps less belligerent, less likely to result in war. Nevertheless, for Pincus, the result was a shift away from animosity towards the Dutch, in terms of the idea that there was room enough for both of these countries to thrive economically, and towards hostility towards the French with their land-based empire. He saw that as the shift rather than anything more profound. It was perfectly possible, therefore, for this new kind of thinking about politics and, and the economy to still result in overseas expansion and in the development of an overseas territorial empire, one based not on the desire for gold, as with someone like Sir Walter Raleigh, um, but instead on colonies as spaces for labor, sources for labor, or indeed outlets for a, a surplus population, not to mention as markets for English goods. In other words, the Tory view as set out by Pincus and the Whig view as set out by Pincus, rival versions of political economy, for sure, could lead to both, could both lead to the same policy, p aggressive pursuit of overseas expansion, and indeed, war. Indeed, despite debate and disagreement, both visions, the Tory and the Whig view, as set out by Pincus, seem to have been predicated upon this idea of a Westphalian system 
of international affairs. Competing sovereign states and an international political economy that was conceived of in terms of geopolitical strategy. Our grand vision for how international politics and the economics, uh, politics and economics worked drives our politics. This is macroeconomics on a political international uh, stage. Seems to me that something has got lost in the process of that debate and that way of thinking. There are other ways of thinking about political economy in the early modern period, which are not predicated on the existence of a system of competing states, independent sovereign states operating in the post-Treaty of Westphalia world. This is not just a, a, a question of demonstrating that new economic thinking of the kind that Pincus detects didn't necessarily lead to better relations with the Dutch, but also um, of observing very different possibilities that were considered and that were important because they were thought to be thinkable, even if they did not always prevail. There were new modes of thinking, in other words, that I want to suggest that emerged, uh, driven by ideas about the economy, but that could um, lead to something other than belligerence, international competition, um, uh, and so on. <coughs> so what I want to do firstly, as promised, is to focus on Anglo-Dutch relations during the period of the First Anglo-Dutch War, 1652-4. to four. And on the possibility that even somebody like Oliver Cromwell, famed for you know, making England great with a big navy and of, you know, beating up lots of uh, uh, foreign powers and, uh, and, and achieving an empire, even somebody like Cromwell, famed as a warrior, had interesting ideas about the possibility for political union between different states. One based in part, at least, on economic considerations. A political economy of international cooperation. This involves Crom examining Cromwell's involvement in talks that brought an end to the Anglo-Dutch War in the summer of 1653, from the si summer of 1653 onwards and confronting, uh, not least, some rather difficult linguistic challenges. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of um, confusing thing to encounter the ways in which contemporaries use the term union and um, coalition. In essence, when they use the term coalition, they mean what we mean by political union, something quite formal. Uh, and when they t use the term union, they mean kind of like a rather loose alliance. Once you get your head around that, then all things seem to fall into place. So this war, this war of 1652 to four, tends to be studied in relation to its causes rather than its aftermath. And as I already said, Pincus challenged the old interpretation of the war as a mercantilist venture, a consequence of the 1651 Navigation Act and a means of com combating the economic threat of the Dutch Republic. He junked that idea. He argued that relations deteriorated because of English attempts to claim sovereignty over the sea around um, the British Isles, something that the Dutch rejected. But he rejected the idea that merchants were in the driving seat, focusing instead on what he called apocalyptic political ideas, apocalyptic republicanism. These apocalyptic republicans, um, you know, since saw war as inevitable because the Dutch uh, were neither good Protestants nor good republicans. As such, Pincus argued, the war represented what he called a punitive move against a corrupt polity. He saw Cromwell, meanwhile, as someone was, who was you know, happy to accept peace if peace was possible, but not ideologically opposed to war. Seems to me that a closer to the truth is uh, 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 the idea that Cromwell was actually determined to, to achieve peace, and he was prepared to rethink national sovereignty not least for economic gain. Cromwell's problem will ultimately be that not enough people in power, or perhaps in the nation as a whole, um, accepted his ideas because they were quite novel. But they are interesting nevertheless, because in 1653, um, here's where my colors perhaps emerge, um, in 1653 it was the English who advocated a political union with their Dutch neighbors in which each state would re retain its local laws and institutions while also creating common citizenship 
common trading privileges and equal rights uh, to both um, uh, reside in either uh, country and hold property um, in, in any country um, with at least some kind of joint sovereign body um, emerging or being created. The Dutch, on the other hand, while they used the language of closer union, this is the, the linguistic game, um, really meant something like an informal um, alliance. Reading Cromwell's speeches to the Dutch, particularly those he made in private when he didn't have to um, confront his, uh, you know, his naysaying colleagues, reading these speeches, it is obviously hard to avoid his sense that closer cooperation between England and the Dutch Republic ought to be driven in part by religious con considerations. This is not all about the economy, it's partly um, about religion. He insisted that the Dutch needed to think about more than mere considerations of profit and friendship based on worldly motives. It's not all about worldly success. And he insisted on the need to concentrate on, quote, the preservation of freedom and the outspreading of the kingdom of Christ. He was also concerned about the ongoing threat from papists everywhere. But he insisted that some way needed to be found to build an agreement that, while respecting, quote, the form and character of the respective governments, would also be, quote, permanent and inviolable. And he certainly introduced economic issues by saying that many people in England were indeed unhappy that the Dutch had, quote, overreached them, i.e. the English, everywhere in commerce. But what he wanted he said, were explicit rules, that's his term, to ensure, quote, the welfare of commerce and navigation, and to, quote, adjust and regulate our common interests in commerce and navigation if we wanted to live in peace and unity. He pointed out, like Pincus's Whigs, that, quote, the world was wide enough for both, i.e. for both states, economically. But he envisaged finding a way to ensure that, quote, if the two peoples could only thoroughly well understand each other, they could, quote, overrule all others and control the markets and dictate the conditions. Cromwell, in other words, talked of a future not of competition with the Dutch, but one in which the two would join forces to maximize their economic might and pursue a Protestant agenda. What makes all of this all the more interesting is that this was backed up by the idea which he floated on the 21st of July, 1653, in the company of the Dutch ambassadors. He floated the idea that, quote, this state is willing to expect the said security by uniting both states in such manner as they may become one people and commonwealth for the good of both. What he had in mind was not so much a league as he's described it, between sovereign states, but rather the making of two sovereign states one, as a federation in which the domestic laws of each country would remain unchanged, but in which they would be, quote, so united as to be under one supreme power, consisting of the persons of both nations. The people of both commonwealths would, quote, enjoy the like privileges and freedoms in respect of habitations, possessions, trade, ports, fishing, and all other advantages whatsoever in each other's countries as natives without any difference or distinction. This was what the Dutch statesman, uh, uh, looking nervously from The Hague, um, this is uh, Johan de Witt, uh, this is what he called a single and unified sovereign government composed of representatives selected equally from the two nations, or a single Dutch, Anglo-Dutch state. That's what he thought the English were offering. And he didn't like it. So ironically, for any observer of Brexit, such ideas were advocated by the English and deemed to be entirely unacceptable by the Dutch, who described such mingling of sovereignties as impossible and unreasonable. This inevitably brought the talks to a crisis, crisis point but Cromwell is the person who, at that point, keeps the, che the channels of communication open. And here, too, the evidence is revealing. Cromwell insisted that he did not want any footing in Holland. He didn't want to meddle in their int what he thought of as their internal affairs, or to encroach, as he said, upon the sovereignty of the Netherlands. But subsequently, he made clear that there ought to be some kind of supreme direction 
which would have control over a range of mutually important matters. Indeed, although the Dutch were relieved that Cromwell backtracked somewhat from his most radical proposal, they also recognized that he wanted something more than a mere alliance or defensive and offensive pact, and that this would mean a joint navy and a permanent Anglo-Dutch board of commissioners or arbitrators resident in each country. In November 1653, Cromwell made clear uh, his recognition that English proposals for a coalition, i.e. a permanent union between the two republics, in which the mutual interests of, of state and of the nations would be combined without any distinction in such a way that no differences or misunderstandings could be feared or expected, did not please the Dutch. He recognized, in other words, that this was an unpopular policy. He recognized that the Dutch wanted something like a loose alliance. A league and confederation as close and strong as had been established between two sovereign republics. But he insisted that what was needed was not a union or peace for a short period, but, quote, a permanent one between the two states and nations. He recognized that steps needed to be taken to, quote, eliminate from the start all points that could eventually lead to, in, to new disputes or animosities. He insisted that if the English idea about a union had been accepted, all interests of governments and nations would have been mutual. And he worried that since the Dutch were speaking of another kind of union, i.e. this weak alliance, in which the interests of each party would remain distinct, new conflicts were likely to arise time and again. He made clear, um, however, that that however flexible he was prepared to be in order to make progress, his own sense was that an alliance which existed only in appearance and in words would be insufficient, and that he was determined to find a permanent solution, which, quote, would not only take away the present differences of opinion, but also provide for the future and regulate all troubles and new disputes. He then affirmed his support for the idea of a formal union yet again, wherein, quote, the whole sovereignty and government would be made common between the two republics and nations, with the sole exception of the administration of justice according to the municipal laws. He dismissed Dutch ideas as involving little more than a mutilated coalition. Indeed, as Cromwell grew frustrated, he made revealing comments about the basis on which he approached Anglo-Dutch cooperation. He began by describing Dutch attempts to draw um, a, 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 a link or a parallel between this coalition that they wanted and a formal union that he wanted. He said, that's incorrect. We cannot draw, make, that, make out that these are the same. And in making clear that he wanted something more than a mere alliance, he also reflected on the idea of sovereignty. What did sovereignty mean? He understood that the Dutch was attached to their idea of sovereignty. They'd only just become independent, as it were, from Spanish rule, so they were quite attached to their, their independence and their, and their sovereignty. But he said, these special words of sovereignty are not very important. He suggested that this term sovereignty was only a feather in the hat and that the burden of government was only a bauble, a decoration. He added that such things were much less important than achieving our principal aim, which was, he said, to obtain security against the House of Obst Austria, i.e. the Habsburgs, i.e. Spain, and to organize our affairs in such a way that we need not fear anybody's power, and that together we could dictate the law concerning commerce to the whole world. In the end, of course, the Treaty of Westminster that brought an end to the war in early 1654 um, involved a very weak form of alliance, not what Cromwell had uh, wanted at all. But what makes scrutiny of Cromwell's uh, uh, ideas interesting is what can be concluded about his approach to European relations. What emerges, therefore, is that Cromwell was almost certainly less bothered about union, um, i.e. the form th th of settlement, than th about the need to secure peace and economic prosperity in order to undermine the Spanish interest. But the talks make clear not just that Cromwell developed a clear vision of a Protestant foreign policy, the preservation of freedom and the outspreading of the kingdom of Christ, but also that his view on the economy involved a notion that there was room enough for both countries, as well as a determination to work with the Dutch to dominate the world economy, 
had also recognized that this required a permanent and inviolable settlement rather than a mutilated coalition. For Cromwell, this meant that what was needed was something other than the protection of national sovereignty and something more like cross-border cooperation. He was willing, in other words, to think in creative ways, and while it might be true that he had not thought through his ideas very clearly, um, it would nevertheless be unfair to suggest, as the Dutch occasionally did, that he simply didn't understand the fundamental issues, that he was basically confused. I think that's an unfair reading. Rather, his willingness to shift between different models of a more substantial union probably reflected the fact that he considered the ends, the goals, a stable Protestant peace with massive economic benefits as more important than the means and was reluctant to place too much store in any one particular constitutional form. At root, however, Cromwell demonstrated an intriguing willingness to recognize that some kind of union might be necessary to, to overcome the fragility of a mere alliance, and that the, in the grand scheme of things, state sovereignty was a mere bauble. A second, and to be dealt with slightly more briefly, uh, a second way of moving beyond conventional approaches to political economy in relation to sovereign states involves thinking about mercantilism in whatever form it took as something that the English simply could not put into practice because of the limitations of their power, or limitations on their power and authority, internally or externally, internationally. Central here is the reality that it was difficult to prevent English men and women from engaging in trade outside England. And that indeed large numbers of English men and women wound up engaging in trade in other places, um, most obviously in the Dutch Republic. In other words, they based themselves abroad. This is one of the issues that historians can think about in relation to what is called, sometimes called, entangled history. The ways in which different societies and economies overlapped and interlocked. And, and how they can think about the challenges that arose in that kind of situation. And the policies that emerged in that kind of situation. And this seems to me to take us into very interesting territory that has begun to be explored by scholars of international law and of uh, empire, most obviously um, Lauren Benton at Vanderbilt, who examines what she calls overlapping and shifting political and legal power and the development of what she calls elastic frameworks within rich relationships of political authority and jurisdiction combined and recombined. Or, in other words, what she calls loose scaffolding for cross-polity interactions, certain kind of political science language there, um, but the idea of cross-polity rethinking of how things work across the borders of states. But it can also be thought about as an issue of political economy and one that involves what Benton calls interpolity relations. And here too I want to explore such territory through the lens of Anglo-Dutch relations in the 17th century. Another example, uh, or a clearer example, of how to think at the level of microeconomics. What's the microeconomics or micro political e economics rather than macroeconomics and grand um, strategy? Let's think about economics as an everyday activity or every c everyday kinds of ec economic behavior and the practices and processes of interaction between states. So, here the aim is to zoom in, if you like. Um, away from geopolitical economics, grand strategy, to political practices and indeed diplomatic practices in order to get different perspectives. And what I want to suggest is that this will make it then possible to zoom back out again. So zoom into the, to the micro study in order to be able to zoom back out again to identify bigger issues with which contemporaries were grappling, namely competing ideas about sovereignty and international cooperation. So one... Um, interest that I certainly share with Pincus involves English perceptions of and comments about the Dutch. There are lots of comments about the Dutch um, in English political discourse in the 17th century. They're obsessed by the Dutch. And here it seems to me there's a danger of focusing on or detecting xenophobia. I, it's easy to find comments about the English slagging off um, the Dutch, being prejudicial about the Dutch, which seems to fit with a sense of competition of hatred, of animosity. The problem is that such comments 
most obviously made in print, in newspapers and so on, were generally made for political purposes, at times of tension and conflict. They cannot be taken, it seems to me, as Pinkers perhaps does, as evidence of the national mood. Such comments also encourage a focus on dipl diplomatic strategy and bloody conflict. There was, of course, that to, to contend with in the 17th century, but it would be wrong merely to focus on Anglo-Dutch relations as evidence for struggles for mastery of, in Europe in a Europe of dyn dynastic powers and sovereign states. This is not just because it fits uneasily with what we know about what you might call cultural exchange, the ways in which England and the Dutch Republic were culturally intertwined and learned from each other, the world that Lisa Jardine describes, but also because it makes other things, um, uh, it masks, sorry, other things relating to political culture. And this involves the English seeking to understand the Dutch and to understand a very different political system from the English political system, much more decentralized, much more republican. And not only being alarmed by that system, it was a scary system to behold, um, and by the religious tensions that were obviously evident within the Dutch Republic, but also seeking to work with it. The English were obsessed by the Dutch because their system was different, and they wanted to understand it because they needed to work alongside the Dutch. That's my point. So here we might look to a series of problems, everyday problems, that arose in, relations, uh, in, in relation to the economic activity of English people in the Dutch Republic. There are, for example, there is, for example, in the late 16, 1600s, um, a large group of English cloth workers who set up in business in a Dutch town um, uh, in order to um, you know, pursue their trade. There's a massive English cloth trade in one Dutch town in the late 17th century, it's extraordinary. Dotted across the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, any number of English men and women involved in the book trade, in printing, in publishing, in journalism. The problem that this created was that many such people can be thought of um, as political and religious exiles. They were described as fanatics by the English government. It caused the English government headaches because of their involvement in forms of agitation, in plotting. Some of them were involved in plotting, but they were also involved in an entangled economy. It was unclear who had control over these people. If you're an English merchant married to a Dutch woman living in Amsterdam, you may have local citizenship rights. Who controls your behavior? Is it the English government or the Dutch government? Therein lies a massive difference of opinion between the English and the Dutch. That is a major headache. In essence, what it involves is competing notions of citizenship. Charles I, Charles II, James II, English monarchs think, if you're born in England, I don't care where you are in the world, you're my subject, I control you. The Dutch believe, I don't care where you're born, if you're living in the Dutch Republic, you're a Dutch citizen. If that person causes trouble, if that English man or woman causes offense to the English monarch, what can the English monarch do about it? The Dutch view is they are untouchable by you. We will protect them. What do you do if you're an English monarch in that situation? You could engage in what you might think of, or what we might now term, extraordinary rendition. You capture them, you smuggle them home, you put them on trial in England. It is attempted. It is attempted in 1661, 1662. There are some people who've been involved in killing Charles I, they flee to Holland, they are, in a sense, captured, a rather muscular approach to international relations. They are captured by George Downing, the man who gives his name to Downing Street, um, and sent back to England to meet their bloody fate on the scaffold. The problem is you can't do that all the time because the Dutch are bloody annoyed um, with that kind of behavior and they insist that it will never happen again. In that situation, it is impossible to maintain the myth that the English government has power over those people, even though they're English born. What you have to then do is to work with the Dutch authorities. You need a workaround in that situation. You might say, 
please send this person back to England, accompanied by Dutch guards, so that we can talk to them, maybe intimidate them, maybe question them, but then let them go back to their normal life in the Dutch Republic, unmolested. That's a much more common response. That's a response to entanglement. It's a response to the fact that you don't have power over those people. What that seems to me to represent is a concession, an admission that the sovereignty, the sovereignty of the English monarch or the English government is somewhat of a myth. It's limited, it's constrained, it's confined. The thing to do is to respond to those challenges and difficulties in creative ways. And this seems to me to involve a very different kind of political economy. But it is political economy. And it has almost, been, uh, in, almost entirely been overlooked by historians of this period. But it's something that can be seen again and again, and occasionally in ways in, in, in which, which prove extraordinarily revealing about the awareness on the part of those involved of the fundamental issues that were at stake and of the reality of international relations in this kind of entangled world. One more brief example before I conclude. And this involves perhaps the most famous flashpoint in Anglo-Dutch relations um, of the 17th century. It's called the Amboyna Massacre of 1623. It involved the execution, literal execution, killing, judicial execution, by officials of the Dutch East India Company of some English plotters or English merchants in Amboyna in what is now Indonesia for plotting against the Dutch economic interests in the region. It caused a huge stir, caused lasting resentment. They're still talking about it almost 100 years later. At any time when there's tension, they bring up the English grievance of Amboyna because it, had been, it proved very difficult for the English to get justice for these victims of Dutch power. This was a classic problem of economic entanglement and of what you might call jurisdictional complexity. Who has the power or the right to exercise legal or judicial um, authority in this situation on that and on this issue? The English struggled, as I said, to find a way of ensuring that justice was done as they saw it. It's a fundamentally intractable problem made worse by the immense influence of the Dutch East India Company within the Dutch state. They are said to be a state within a state. The Dutch government won't do anything that will offend the Dutch East India Company, um, and thus the English will never get justice. That's the problem. So while um, the affair over Amboyna has been noted by historians, it's quite famous. Uh, there are some wonderful images of you know, English, these poor English merchants being subjected to water torture. It's quite hard to depict in a 17th century woodcut, but you have a very thin man and then a very fat man um, with a hose going in his mouth. Um, it's famous. This episode is famous. But it's not always been thought about in the right way, it seems to me. It's tempting to focus on it um, in terms of the challenge that the East English East India Company faced in getting help from the English government. Why won't you help us get justice, they say to the English government. And it is sometimes said that this is because the English are too afraid of annoying um, the Dutch. The English government is too afraid of annoying the Dutch because they are allies in the Thirty Years' War. But a different perspective, it seems to me, is possible. This involves the English ambassador, Dudley Carlton, in The Hague, recognizing the nature of the Dutch political system, the wheels of which, he said, turn very slowly, and also recognizing the temperament of the Dutch and of Dutch uh, public opinion. This all led him to advise against heavy-handed or provocative gestures. Let's not, he said, take Dutch hostages. Um, that won't work. He recognized that it would be necessary to think creatively if justice was to be secured in a situation where the Dutch refused to send the culprits, the alleged culprits, to face justice in England. Why would they? And where the next best option might be to send English witnesses to, to uh, Holland or the Dutch Republic to give evidence to be examined by Dutch lawyers. That was also a, a less than perfect solution. So what do we do? Ultimately, what makes the affair fascinating to me is that English politicians and diplomats proposed some kind of joint effort 
involving people from both governments and indeed what was referred to as joint judicature, their term. This would have been a temporary mechanism to deal with a past crime, but they also sought a better way forward for the future, which meant building upon a 1690, 1619 treaty between the two um, companies, rather uh, neglected treaty, which had called for the idea of a council of defense to settle economic disputes between the two companies in the East Indies. What this meant was a joint panel to resolve any economic differences. But what they now proposed was a new mechanism to add to this, such that if that didn't work, if that joint panel couldn't reach a conclusion, matters would be referred back to the companies in London and The Hague, and then to the two governments, the English and Dutch governments. This would need, they recognized, a joint body to settle everything. Here too, in other words, we see entanglement over economic issues creating political problems that result in creative thinking. And incidentally, an idea incredibly similar to some of the proposals that have emerged about what will life will be like in a, could be like in a post-Brexit world. How will we solve things in a post-Brexit world? Well, we might need a kind of temporary, specific, joint body to solve matters. Amazing how history um, is, uh, echoes down through the ages. This is a, pro a creative uh, form of thinking that recognizes shared jurisdiction, the pooling, if you like, of sovereignty uh, in some way. It was a pragmatic political solution to economic entanglements in a new world of global trade. And although, again, it founded on the idea uh, 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 of Dutch opposition, the Dutch did not like this idea, they wanted to claim absolute sovereignty over the Dutch East Indies. It also faced opposition from within the English East India Company. Nevertheless, it seems to me to be interesting or valuable as a sign of how contemporaries could think beyond simple notions of state sovereignty and recognize that sovereignty could be compromised, even if only pragmatically, and even if only occasionally. So, to conclude, there would be all sorts of ways of extending this kind of analysis. Let's turn to microeconomics think about the economic entanglements and the political issues that arise. All sorts of other flashpoints that required new ways of thinking. There were lots of areas of everyday economic life, in other words, that raised questions about how states interacted and dealt with the issues that arose from interaction or entanglement. Not all of these are super exciting in the way that Amboyner is exciting and dramatic. How does the international postal system work in the 17th century? Less sexy a topic than the Amboyna massacre. But the same fundamental issues um, arise. How can we work together when our systems are entangled? Each of them, we could s find a series of aspects of economic life, microeconomics, if you like, rather than macroeconomics. Not the stuff about wars, alliances, and grand strategy, but the microeconomic, the microhistorical in order to open up new ways of thinking about the relationship between politics and economics in the early modern period. These new ways of thinking did not necessarily spring from new economic theories or indeed from theories of any kind. They weren't necessarily theorized very clearly. In the realm of interpolity um, uh, relations, we are dealing, dealing with the importance of practical concerns, practical solutions rather than theoretical solutions or grand visions. But there's certainly a sense that new ideas fostered new ways um, of doing things, new ways of thinking and behaving. And this is certainly, and it is certainly true that economic ambitions and realities can be thought to have underpinned new kinds of political thinking and practice. And that is a form of um, political economy and one that involved them somehow confronting some of the biggest ideas that there were, sovereignty and what it meant. Thus, it is not only evident that grand economic ambitions sometimes need to be recognized as being allied with other strategic goals, like international Protestantism, Protestantism, that is true. It is also evident that um, these kinds of issues, Protestantism, could provoke radical solutions about the political mechanisms that would be most useful as a means of achieving such ends. 
It's also evident that issues which arose from entanglement on the ground, interlocking economic systems, either within Europe or on the other side of the world, made it necessary to recognize the limits of sovereignty, to recognize jurisdictional challenges, and that this sometimes led to creative thinking about how to respond by sharing or pooling sovereignty. In different ways, therefore, and even if only pragmatically, it proved possible to develop political economies that were not predicated on national sovereignty, on the Westphalian system, and on competition, let alone warfare, but rather on forms of cooperation that went beyond strategic military alliances. These forms of cooperation involved shifts in ideas about sovereignty, in which the latter was regarded as a divisible bundle of capacities, rather than as a monopoly power exercised over bounded territories by a single unitary authority. What this means is that the alternative to the Westphalia system was not necessarily a noble vision of European cooperation and integration, as became evident in the 18th century, in the post-1945 world, and in at least some parts of Europe now. Um, but it did involve a willingness to think beyond national sovereignty in certain circumstances, to think about Europe in terms other than of war, peace, and alliances, and to think about how political cooperation could happen after Westphalia. It is perhaps true that this can be glimpsed most obviously in, relation to, in terms of relations between England and the Dutch Republic. They had a history of amity and of mutual assistance. And, the growing, um, and there was also growing admiration within certain English circles about the Dutch political system. So it is true that the Anglo-Dutch situation is unusual. Nevertheless, it is also intriguing to reflect on a time when it was the English, more obviously than the Dutch, who thought about how best to maximize the benefits to be gleaned from facilitating trade and the movement of people across borders and from novel forms of political cooperation. Thank you. this proposed um, sort of pooling of sovereignty between the English and the Dutch, um, and uh, if I'm reading your argument correctly, um, that this, was, this would have been a genuine pooling of sovereignty, a sort of um, dim, you know, diminution of, of British sovereignty, and, and or rather of English sovereignty, and also of Dutch sovereignty. Um, it, to what extent do you think that this, this might have been sort of a veil, and, and sort of a veiled attempt at when you have two unequal countries, I mean, I mean, I, I think it's fairly clear that the English felt that they were in a strong position and were therefore offering this uh, be precisely because of that strong position and that they would sort of garner more benefit out of it, at least in a relative sense. And uh, just to bring it to the, we're trying to make a, a more modern connection, the same sense of the pooling or the proposed pooling of sovereignty and sort of, if you want to be, you know, sort of a, a vivified EU, right, where it's an actual sharing of sovereignty rather than whatever it is we have now with that, um, but that's actually, there have been arguments, especially since the Euro crisis, that that would actually just be a veiled form of German, or if you want to put it, Franco German, yeah, yeah, sort of yeah, financial yeah. hegemony, right? So like, yeah. do you, I don't know if, to what extent you would, you would take that argument, or how, what would you make of that? Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think that the reason, well, I suppose I, I think I would uh, want to argue that the way in which Cromwell goes about this, he has a lot of um, skepticism within his own side over this. Um, in fact, there are people who really hate this idea. And it's interesting, therefore, that he... Go, he, he's, he does a lot of this. He's, he is most open about this when he's in private talks with them um, because he knows that this is an unpopular idea. Um, in that sense, I think you know, Cromwell may be rep representative no, of nobody other than Cromwell, but I think the point that comes from that is Cromwell really thinks this is the way forward. And in a sense, I, I think we, we are getting the real Cromwell here. But the other, I, th I suppose the other thing I would say is that the, it's not clear to me at this stage, so uh, let me rephrase that. 
I think there were probably there, there, you could envisage certain situations in the, in the early modern period where exactly that would apply. I think it doesn't apply in the Anglo-Dutch situation because increasingly the two sides have economic you know, parity. Um, there, there, is, there is a sense that the Dutch have um, in some ways developed a certain kind of economic mastery, but they've also just more or less um, lost this war. So in, in a sense, it's, you know, if it had been the other way around and the, and the Dutch had effectively won the war, then um, you, know, that c you could see that kind of logic. But th these are two powers that are increasingly um, coming to the fore economically. And in that sense, um, it, is, it, is, it seems to me a, a, a deal being offered between um, powers that are of similar types of, of, of power. Um, but what that does mean, though, I mean, you're absolutely right to suggest that those kinds, these kinds of ideas, I mean, they didn't even get real traction in that kind of situation. That's the kind of optimal situation. The Anglo-Dutch situation of 1653 is the optimal situation for these kinds of ideas to get traction. They don't even get traction there. So therefore, they certainly wouldn't get traction if there was real disparity in, in terms of economic right. Well, that's something worth thinking about. So in a sense, the, the, the thought uh, 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 behind the question is absolutely right, although I just think in this case, um, it, 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 it doesn't apply in quite that way. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, this question comes out of having recently read, along with many in this room, Thomas Paine and Montesquieu on sort of commerce and republic and things like this. Uh, and one way to interpret that moment that you nicely tell us uh, is that this is a republican alternative to what monarchs throughout Europe have done for centuries and are going to continue to do, which is to, for, for monarchs, you form alliances by marrying daughters and sons in a way that may not be as tight of a union or alliance, but something like that. But to what extent does the, 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 do the Dutch and, and Cromwell have a problem? They're not monarchs where that can be a, a diplomatic tool, right? And is this sort of, in some ways, a, a, an attempted modern twist, if you will, a Republican twist on an ancient and, you know, other early modern problem? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that that's, that's, a, that's a fair point. Um, you know, if, if you're a Republican government, you can't make <laughs> those kind of dynastic strategic alliances that bring two countries um, uh, together. Um, and it is, in that sense, you know, a peculiarity of what might have been is that it relates to two republics. Um, Pincus is sort of right to suggest that the English are skeptical about whether the Dutch are really good um, Republicans. There are too many Dutch people who, who, who secretly hanker after a kind of monarchical system, the House of Orange. Um, uh, so, you know, th how good they are actually as Republicans is a, a, a question of debate. Um, but I think that what, I think it may be true that, that um, well, I suppose two things. One is that those alliance-based, those mon monarchical alliance, um, they turn out to be, in, in the early modern period, not very good ways of cementing uh, 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 partnerships between states. Um, it doesn't matter if, if, the, if, the, if the families are interlocked and, and intermarried. That doesn't seem to do a very good job of stopping them go to war. Um, as the other thing is that, that I think that logic, i.e. that this is a republican mode of doing something that had previously been done in different ways by monarchical regimes, um, that may be the thinking behind the Dutch approach. I think that's probably what, that might be a fair assessment of what the Dutch were looking for in this kind of um, deal. They, they wanted a deal, and they, in, in that sense, the Dutch Republicans wanted a kind of deal, and I think that, that the logic you're describing is um, fair um, for them. I just don't think it works for Cromwell, because if, if, if that was the way that Cromwell thought, why not go for an offensive and defensive alliance of, of the kind the Dutch want? In, in, in a sense, what Cromwell, I think, is saying is that just, you know, experience teaches us something like that. If we just, you know, find a proxy for that kind of uh, deal, it will fail. They all fail. 
they, they, they prove a temporary boost and a long-term disaster. We need something that's a more permanent thing. That's that. So, you know, and in the end, him, him saying th the ends are more important than the means um, is him saying we need to find a permanent solution because hitherto states have never found a permanent solution to that. Um, in your talk, one of the things you stress is the idea that we have to um, understand that people saw things differently back in the old days. So one of the examples you give is um, the notion of wealth, the notion of wealth, what that means, and the uh, idea of it as being finite, yeah. kind of um, zero sum thing. Um, and um, you apply that, I think this is what I mean from the taxes or the economists or something, that uh, we don't see wealth that way. It should be a win-win <coughs> situation. Um, well, it's not just sort of finite. Um, so, uh, but I would say that another uh, group that um, whose narrative of uh, wealth um, that is becoming more important um, is maybe somebody like the environmentalists who seem to be trying to redefine what wealth means and stress very vividly that it actually is finite on their own earth. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, perhaps in academia or, or how people, um, whether people's concept of wealth, um, what the debates are, or whether that's um, factored in a combination of wealth. I mean, historically, um, in, in terms of how historians study the 16th century or the 17th century, they think about, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is they are f confronted with the need to think about um, the ways in which contemporaries introduced other notions into their equations about what matters. Um, so it's not quite the same thing, um, although it can ultimately, um, so they don't think about the environment. Right? They don't think about the environment as a thing, a big thing, a kind of a, an interconnected s ecosystem um, uh, in, in quite the way that we do. They think about environmental factors, and so there is a connection, in this, I think, in the sense that they can think about the impact of environmental factors on economics and how economics might need to be thought about in ways that take account of that. The classic way in which they do that is, uh, an, you know, E.P. Thompson is the, is the great historian of this, who recovered, in a sense, or unearthed a way of thinking that he detected in the early modern period, which is called the moral economy. Um, and he says that plenty of people act in ways that reveal that they don't just value wealth in, in, uh, 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 and, um, in monetary terms. They don't just think in monetary terms. They think about the morality of the economy. They think about, you know, and this comes into stark uh, relief, or is put into stark relief, or comes into sharp focus in moments of economic, uh, uh, of environmental catastrophe. Uh, so drought, flood, you know, dearth, um, famine, that introduces a situation where they, are, where they think, hang on, we cannot just let scarcity lead to price rises because that will introduce, uh, you know, that won't solve anything. Lots of people will starve because nobody will be able to afford those prices. You know, the laws of supply and demand, they understood the laws of supply and demand and that if there is less supply, prices will go up. But they said, no, no, but we cannot let that happen. We have to have a notion of fairness. What is a fair price? And in a sense, what he said, is, what he di discerned was that there were people who were prepared to say, in those, you know, straightened and in a sense environmentally created um, uh, uh, disaster areas, they, you know, if, even if only in those circumstances, he discerned that there were people whose behavior reveals that that's the way they think. Because what they will do is they will, they will, there will be riots that seize grain and then give it to the justice of the peace. It's not riots to feed, or, you know, it's not, we're not going to seize this grain so that we can eat and make bread. We seize it to draw, to give it to the authorities to draw attention to the fact that there's an unfairness creeping in here. Now, that's a rather 
meandering way of saying that they, they have a notion of, of how the environment might raise issues about things that, that, that require a, a mode of thinking that doesn't just um, value wealth. It values morality. So uh, in that sense, I think that the, the, the um, you know, whether they would have conceptualized that in terms of thinking about the environment, but they are prepared, they are able, it's an analogous type of uh, way of thinking because it involves the notion that they could think, even if only at times, and not very clearly, not very well theorized or conceptualized, they were able to think about um, a series of factors that needed to be taken into account when deciding on issues of wealth and the economy. And that might be morality or religion rather than pure wealth. And that is, you know, Thompson says that that is a world that then is, is lost. It might be a world that in our era of, uh, of environmental um, I don't know, doom, catastrophe, problems, whatever you want to call them, or how, however severe you think that environmental issue is, it might actually be a situation in which older modes of thinking re-enter, i.e. that we, th we think about um, things other than wealth in monetary terms, in terms of how we should do things. Uh, it's not, I mean, I suppose that is um, the logic of uh, environmental politics. Modern environmental politics is to say we can place a value on things that's not financial. And that, and, and you know, and I, I think it's plausible, therefore, to see that that involves a mode of thinking not unlike certain modes of thinking about the economy in the early modern period. Right, right or wrong, you know. Thank you, Jason. Let's give a round of applause. some fresh air.